Everyone in this room shares a stake, or perhaps better stated as a dog in this fight, when it comes to fostering the rule of law. We've seen very recently how critical this is in the world in the events unfolding in Northern Africa, China and the Middle East. We are all here because we share that passion for the rule of law. Some of us are those responsible for those containers, some of us are creators, and others of us have other roles in fostering the rule of law. Historically, the rule of law has been able to be passed on because it has been preserved in media that has allowed it to be preserved over time. Others have come in to help assist in accessing the rule of law. So for over a century we have had things like the topic and key numbering system. And the Library of Congress uses class K to help us organize law. There are languages that existed for law that no longer are understandable to most of us today. So how many of us are comfortable understanding law in Latin or law French or even Old English? There are languages that existed for law that no longer are understandable to most of us today. So how many of us are comfortable understanding law in Latin or law French or even Old English? So as we look at the things that we produce today, and where we might be in 10 years or 100 years hence, will people understand the way we communicated the rule of law? Will they understand the language we use? The phraseology? Or the reasoning we use by which we came to our conclusions? That is the grand challenge, and we have a shared fear that our rule of law will look to us as if it is non-legal, non-lawyerly, non-citable, unpublished, and was tweeted from the bench of the U.S. Supreme Court. Over time and history, the pen has proved mightier than the sword. And now we are wondering if the iPad is mightier than the pen. That is another challenge for us. We exist in the best part of a discipline, and that is that it is transdisciplinary. It is infused by the knowledge of a myriad of disciplines that help define its structure. And another exciting thing about law is that it truly exists in three-time dimension. It exists in the past because we really understand the concept of the long tail, and the minutia back in the Roman Empire. It exists in the present because we call upon the law to resolve disputes between individuals or by making statutes and regulations helping individuals to engage in the stream of commerce. It regulates their lifestyles and provides health and safety. It also exists as a service to future generations. Helping frame our values and enable the inheritance of structure in those future lives. Recently, we've seen Watson show his stuff on Jeopardy. But really, Watson is what is called superficial intelligence. As we go forward, our capacity for intelligence will be increased tremendously by two factors in science. BNX and pharmaceuticals. What we see now is our capacity for memory, comprehension and sight may not be the same as it will be in the future. That is important for us to understand as we think about the future. And the last observation is that law is much more like a coral reef in that it draws from many sources and it doesn't, over time, have a structure like a skyscraper, where you can distinguish what are the bricks, what are the mortar, what is the steel, what the supports are. For those who are afraid of the trends they see in the rule of law, need to think of that coral reef metaphor much more than of the formalistic building that has been added to over time. By thinking of the coral reef, there are some socio-informatic trends and legal research insights that need to be addressed. Let's get an image going in our head of what information overload means. In a recent Science Magazine article, it said that we getting the equivalent of 174 newspapers worth of information every day foist upon us. And individuals send out the equivalent of six newspapers of information every day. So, even though I get up in the morning and skip four newspapers, that means that by the time I get to work, I still have 170 newspapers worth of information left to read. We have expectations these days from our users of programmed assistance. People have been willing to give up what previous generations held sacred in terms of privacy in order to help them cope with information overload. They have accepted search engine optimization, programmed assistance, user profiling, and all kinds of other things. In that whole process, they've also come to expect a phenomenal customer experience as well. Experience being the operative word. Just as we now have edutainment, People expect an experience today in everything they do. The technologist Jerry Lanier has said that there is an entire loss of personal experience today. 
Although people know a lot about things today, they have lost the ability to personally experience many things. People are also expecting to see things in a much more visual way. We've had fun and taken a number of Supreme Court cases lately and put them into wordles to see how they look visually. Will that be the future of decision making? Will judges hand down wordles rather than opinions? It is not just the X and the Y generations. All of us have had a reduced attention span. Probably due to the incredible stimuli that we are getting from the 174 newspapers worth of information each day. There are futurists that predict that our entire vocabulary will be limited to what is now called the air traffic controller's vocabulary. Where a vocabulary of 600 words in English are used everywhere in the world in order to make sure that pilots and air traffic controllers communicate in order to safely operate airplanes across the world. Futurists are predicting that our vocabulary will shrink, as oxymoronic as that initially sounds, in order for us to communicate more widely across culture and languages. Think about how that affects how we communicate today. Today's college students are not siloed any longer. They are asked to participate in a number of disciplines in order to solve problems. We've moved from a what you know to a how you know it type of educational system. Think how that affects publishing and the rule of law. We now see in writing, less variation in word choice, and that words and sentences are shorter. That is probably not because society is intentionally being dumbing itself down, but that shorter sentences, shorter words and less variation in language allows a coping mechanism that helps us to deal with information overload. Looking at law in the context of social media, it is clear that social media looks at information exchange in a decentralized, multi-directional information frame. Law looks at information in a very compartmentalized, formalized and hierarchical information frame. So there is a tension in how information is flowing in society and how our information has traditionally flowed through society. Social media is personal, personality-driven, and connection-driven. Law is designed to be impersonal, independent and objective. These differences create a tension on how information is flowing through society and how our information has traditionally flowed through society. New media is multimedia. Law is still largely text. Another phenomenon was reported on February 19th in the Wall Street Journal. We have a decreasing amount of common knowledge among us. So there is much more information available. Each piece of information is being consumed by less and less numbers of people than in the past. That is critical to us in the reliance upon the common knowledge and law, common values, shared observations. There is a demand for a transparency in all sectors of society. Those in the commercial sector are probably horrified by all the things that customers want you to expose to them. Even in the government, there is a shock at the amount of information that the public wants to know. Society is becoming increasingly transparent. The trend that individuals give up privacy goes hand in hand with the demand that corporations and governments become more transparent. That is the trade-off. Western culture is noticing a great shift in what the predominant cultures are. As we learn about things like BRIC, Brazil, Russia, India, China, Korea, Soniet, South Africa, Nigeria, Israel, Indonesia, and Turkey, we see how differently these rising economies are from us and their culture. Not just a difference in language, but also religious and social values are different from our Western values. For example, China's values versus the Western values. We are focused on the individual. When we look to the rule of law, we look to values that will preserve the individual's rights. Traditional Chinese society is focused on the community over the individual and that community may ask the individual to give us certain rights for the good of the community. This is an accepted and perhaps foundational value in Chinese culture and society. How will this change not only the way the rule of law is received and written, but also how it affects things like copyright, piracy, and other things that are more focused on the individual rights over the overall good of the community as a whole. In the next video, we will start with trends in law and law practice.